Welcome everyone. My name is Murat Brons and I will be presenting our work on real-time fault detection on small fixed-wing UAVs using machine learning. This work has been co-authored by Elgiz Başkaya, Daniel Dele, and Stefan Peshmorel from INAC, French Civil Aviation University. Needless to say that we started to see drones in our daily life more and more often, accomplishing complex missions and attempting difficult tasks. They are pushing their performance to the limits in order to achieve longer flight times or carrying heavier payloads, sometimes in harsh environments or just in urban areas. This close interaction brings the safety demands within. The future generation of these vehicles has to be more intelligent adaptive and tolerant in order to cope with the safety and reliability requirements. In this study, we have concentrated on the detection problem, and our main contribution is to demonstrate how the real-life data looks like and how the algorithms handles these data. By giving it to the hands of other researchers that are interested in fault and anomaly detection, we basically follow the initiative started by Kepur et al, the alpha dataset, and we have open sourced our full dataset as well. It consists more than six hours of flight, containing at least two hours of faulty flight per phase. As it can be seen, the faults are not catastrophic. They are just sustainable, and the vehicle is capable of seeing, still maintaining its attitude and altitude. Therefore, it's not a skewed dataset. It can be found in the GitHub link below. After this brief introduction, I'll be presenting you the flight test path platform and the autopilot software that we have used. Then the fault detection algorithm SVM and the feature trajectory generation. And afterwards, the results that we have obtained during the fault detection in real flights, including binary and multi-class classification and a brief touch on how the real-life imperfections such as twisted wing affects the prediction performance. Then I will close my presentation with the takeaways. Continuing with flight test platform, let me introduce you the hardware setup that we have. So the picture that you're seeing is showing all of the system that is required to do the complete test. There's a computer which is the ground control station, just a regular laptop. And on top of the screen, you can see the XB uh, radio modem in order to have the co communication between the ground control station and the aircraft. There is a regular uh, RC transmitter in order to have the safety link for the safety pilot and a hand manufactured EPP uh, flying wing configuration that is used for the tests. The aircraft has a wingspan of 1.2 meter with a mass of around 750 grams. With the battery capacity of 30 watt hours on board, it can fly almost one hour with the flight speed of 12 to 13 meter per second. It has a motor from T Motors, which is 22008 with a KV of 1100. And we were using the autopilot from Paparazzi the Chimera version 1.0 uh, and the companion board which was doing all of the prediction and the inference on board was the Raspberry Pi Zero version 1.3. For the flight control of the vehicle we are using Paparazzi autopilot system. Paparazzi is an open source project which has started in 2003 since, and, and since 2005 it has been supported at INAC for aviation students and right now well-known and established universities are using it for their lectures and projects as well such as TV Delft. Collecting and sharing the data is one of the most important objectives of this study. Therefore during the flight we have gathered three types of log. The first one is on the ground control station GCS which records all of the messages received from the telemetry and also from the ground agents. Because of the bandwidth restrictions, the sampling rate is low on this log. The second one is the onboard SD card log, which is a, which is a separate thread running in the autopilot. And we can run really fast 
in the order of 100 or 200 hertz in this log. And the third one is the recorded one which is inside the companion board. And these are just a limited sensory information which is only used to generate the feature trajectory for the prediction of the faults. With the help of these logs, we can train a model or just simulate what was happening during the real flight or what would have happened if we have used a different model in the real flights, for example. I would like to continue with the fault detection methodology that we have used. First of all, I want to remind you that the main objective of this study is not to develop the best performing classifier or find the most suitable feature representation. We are more interested in showing how the real life data differs from the synthetic simulation data. Therefore, as an example classification algorithm, we have chosen the SVM support vector machines. SVMs are fairly good on generalization as they construct maximum margin separator. And with the help of so-called kernel trick, SVMs can represent nonlinear separator linearly in the high dimensional space. Additionally, SVMs can combine the advantages of parametric and non-parametric methods, which helps them to represent complex functions while being resistant to overfitting. With all these properties, we thought that the SVMs are a good fit for the demonstration of our objectives here. In order to generate labeled data, we are injecting the faults to the control surfaces in a controlled manner. The common actuator failure cases for an aircraft is basically locked in place, floating around a trim, hard over, and loss of effectiveness. The actuator fault model that is used in this study is shown in the equation, where the U app is the applied control deflection, which is the final movement of the aerodynamic control surface. U com is the commanded control deflection from the autopilot to the actuators, and the E is the offset. For example, by the use of this equation, actuator loss of effectiveness can be modeled by changing D only. And locked in place can be modeled by making D is equal to zero and changing the E offset to the locked in place angle. The airframe, the airframe used in this work has only two aerodynamic control surfaces and a motor. We have only concentrated on the faults injected to the aerodynamic control surfaces, especially the loss of effectiveness of the control surfaces because flying with such a fault type is still possible even with an underactuated platform as ours. Hard over type faults typically results in a sudden spin towards the ground and cannot be controlled at all. So all of the results that we are going to show is for the loss of efficiency, namely the change of D1 and D2 coefficients. It is usually desirable to reduce the number of input features to both reduce the computational cost of the modeling and in some cases to improve the performance of the model by removing the unrelated information. Here, it is decided that a basic feature list will suffice to show the feasibility of proposed idea. Therefore, without a complex feature engineering, we directly use the linear accelerations, angular rates and the autopilot commanded controls for the two aerodynamic actuators, adding up to a vector of eight elements. Information on the temporal dynamics is added by concatenating 20 of those eight element basic feature list. Finally, we obtain a 160 element vector as an input feature trajectory to the SVM algorithm. SVMs assume that all features are centered around zero and have variance in the same order. In order to prevent the domination of any single attribute in the feature vector, we standardize features by removing the mean and scaling to the unit variance. The figure shows a set of feature trajectories, starting from top, dark black, the newest trajectory, going down, light gray, the older trajectories. Each trajectory has 160 points, and the objective is to classify these trajectories. For the buildup of feature trajectories, sensory information is passed from autopilot to the inference computer, which is Raspberry Pi Zero right now, at a frequency of 10 Hertz. Piling up the buffer, which is 20 time history, takes two seconds. 
we call the inference prediction only once the feature trajectory buffer is completed, so every two so seconds only. A ring buffer can be used to increase the prediction frequency, for example. The prediction call in the inference takes about 0 0.06 seconds of computation time, so increasing the prediction frequency up to 10 Hz can be possible for the current hardware. Using a more powerful companion board such as Jetson Nano or Jetson Xavier NX will increase the prediction frequency at least one, or one order of magnitude. With all of that information said, let's continue with the prediction performance in real flights. As a general information on the whole real flight experiments, firstly, all of the flights are done at 90 meter height above ground level. There was a safety pilot who can take over at any moment. We have used SVM algorithm with radial basis function kernel, which is optimized with grid search. And for the real-time predictions, we have used previously trained models uploaded to the inference which was always Raspberry Pi Zero in this condition. As a, first, as a first example, we have made a flight on the 12th of July 2020. And on the figure, you're seeing the path of the 15-minute portion of that flight, which includes nominal and faulty parts. We specially performed a figure eight pattern in order to include, include straight lines, right turns, left turns, and the transitions in between them so that the dataset will be symmetrical, symmetrical as possible. Once we trained the SVM on that collected data, we obtained the performance metrics shown on the table below, which are very promising and encouraging. I would like to ask you to remember the smoothness of the path following actually, which will be referenced in the future. We have uploaded the perfectly trained model to the inference and repeated the same flight on the next day. You can see the flight path in the figure. Can you realize the difference already? You're seeing the real-time prediction performance in this figure. Applied faults, uh, applied faults are shown for the ground truth on the top and instantaneous predictions are shown in blue on the bottom. Additionally, in shaded green, the prediction state is shown, which is basically a function that switches the states only after receiving three consecutive equal predictions. As you can see, the prediction performance is very, very poor and unacceptable. You can also see it, it, see it numerically on the performance metric table below. So what has changed between the days? So here you are seeing the two flights made on consecutive days, on 12th and on 13th. As you can see, the variance is increased on the flight of 13th of July. The reason is the higher wind speeds actually. And we can see that on the sensory data as well. You are looking at the angular rate measurements and commanded actuator, uh, actuator angles for both days. It is very clear how turbulent the second day was and how hard the controller has to work in order to stabilize the vehicle on the second day actually. By the way, all of these data is included in the full data set and can be examined uh, freely. If only we could have changed the order of the days. So for a second, let's think that we flew first on 13th, trained our model and tried the real time prediction on the 12th. We can virtually do that actually. So here is what we, what we would have obtained in that case. The predictions are way much more closer to the reality. There are some instantaneous false predictions. However, the state shown in gray, green stabilizes almost all of them. So the results are also shown numerically in the table. And this proves the fact that we can do binary classification on real flight data. Now I would like to switch to another important real-life effect, imperfections, on the manufacturing, on the trim, or on the measurements, etc. First, reminding you that we are using a foam aircraft assembled by hand, so there are lots of imperfections, and here you can barely see that, you need to believe to me, the left wing of the aircraft is twisted upward. 
This deformation increases the local angle of attack of the left wing, which generates positive rolling moment, meaning right wing going downward. Therefore, the aircraft has a tendency to turn right. And again, therefore, in order to go straight and stabilize the rolling moment, the left control surface has to have a built-in negative deflection as shown also in the figure. This required negative deflection comes from the integrator of the PID controller automatically, and the user doesn't even realize that the problem is there in the nominal conditions. However, once there is an injected fault which reduces the efficiency of the, of the control surfaces, the autopilot controller has to augment its commanded values proportionally in order to obtain the same applied control deflection. The explained effect on the augmented commands can be observed from the flight logs as well. For example, here the upper plot shows the injected faults, 0 meaning nominal, 1 meaning right L1, D1 is 0 0.3, 2 meaning left L1, D2 is equal to 0 0.3. And on the bottom plot, uh, the, the commanded controls shown. When the injected fault code is 2, meaning that the left L1 control efficiency is reduced to 30% of its nominal capacity, D2 is equal to 0 0.3, the commanded control values augments significantly higher compared to D1 is equal to 3 case. The augmented values increases the embedded information in the signal, therefore the detection of D2 is easier compared to the detection of D1 faults. Finally, let's look at a multi-class classification trial. Again, we have made two flights on consecutive days and applied nominal and eight different fault cases as shown in table. All of them are control effectiveness reduction faults. We have gathered the data on the first day, trained the model and validated as shown on the whole flight data. Promising results as before, even for the multi-class cases, with the performance metrics higher than 90% for almost all of the cases. When we try the trained model on the real-time prediction on the next day, the results are not as bad as the binary case that we have seen before. However, there are lots of false predictions and the performance metrics are as low as 30 to 40% which is not acceptable. However, right now, as we have lots of data, we can train on a bigger data dataset and check the new model's performance. And we can see that the prediction state becomes almost perfect with some instantaneous false predictions, of course. We could say that obtained results are satisfactory, even for the hard to detect multi-class fault predictions. In summary, we have shown that the binary class and multi-class classification is feasible from real flight data in real time. The wider the spectrum of the data used in the training, the better the generalization of the model it gets. Additionally, some common geometrical imperfections such as wrapped or twist wings, which are common in small-scale UAVs, can be beneficial to detect certain type of faults. On the other hand, they could be too specific to the vehicle itself and probably will not transfer easily to other vehicles. Finally, as the main contribution of this work, we have open sourced all of the flight logs that we have recorded during this study. Right now, we are working on reconfiguration of the controller according to the detected fault in real time. And we will of course keep working on comparison of different types of algorithm and better representation of feature trajectories. Thank you very much for your attention. And you can reach the, to the dataset and all related software, including the SVM models from the link below.